Good afternoon, everybody, from the Johnson Space Center here in Houston, Texas. I'm Josh Byerly. We'd like to welcome you to today's news conference as we take a look at the upcoming historic demonstration mission by SpaceX to the International Space Station. We are joined by an entire panel today, which includes Bill Gerstemeyer, NASA's Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations. We also have Mike Suffordini, the Program Manager for the International Space Station. We are also joined by Alan Lindemoyer, NASA's Commercial Orbital Transportation Services Program Manager as well as Elon Musk, the Chief Executive Officer and Chief Designer for SpaceX. And finally, we have Holly Ridings, who is the NASA Flight Director, who will be on console during the upcoming flight. We'll start off with Bill. Thanks, Josh. Um, today we did the uh, flight readiness review for uh, the SpaceX Dragon flight. Um, this was uh, not a shuttle flight review um, in the sense that we didn't really look at uh, all the aspects of the launch. We really just focused really on the ISS portion of the launch. And this is very similar to what we've done in the past for uh, the automated transfer vehicle and also for the uh, Japanese transfer vehicle, the HTV. What we do in the review is we make sure that the station is ready to receive the vehicles, uh, that the uh, teams are trained, that the crew on orbit is ready, that we thought about all the contingencies that could occur, and we're really ready to go, go through the demonstration mission. And, and again, I think the teams are, are very well prepared. Um, the SpaceX team gave us a nice... Uh, kind of introductory review of what they've done and their preparations. That was a very thorough discussion by the SpaceX team. They've done a tremendous amount of work getting ready to get to get to this point. They've done a lot of work in terms of both hardware, getting it ready to go fly, getting the software ready to go fly. I was very impressed with the, the overall work. Um, again, I think they've made tremendous progress as a team. So they've got uh, one more long simulation to go do, <coughs> one more simulation to do, and Holly will probably talk about that some more. Um, there's still some work we need to do, some more software testing that needs to get done, some other activities. Everything looks good as we head towards the April 30th launch date, but I would caution us all that there's still quite a bit of work that needs to be done. There's some things we've got to do on our side to validate some software and things after the SpaceX, te SpaceX team completes, and we've, our teams will have to go look at that data and then make sure that it's all okay. So I think there's, there's a good chance to, to make the 30th. We'll continue to work through this stuff over the next week or so. On the 23rd of April, we'll get back together again and just kind of assess where we are overall to see how things are moving forward. But again, tremendous progress by the teams. I was very impressed with the discussion between the NASA teams and the SpaceX teams. When I, when I hear the discussion back and forth, it's really one team. They're really focused on how do we deliver cargo to space station? How do we get ready for this next phase? And, and these teams have worked just phenomenally well together. So. With that kind of attitude, I look forward to, uh, to good activities as we move, move towards the launch. So thank you. Mike? Well, good afternoon. Uh, we're uh, always excited when we uh, have a vehicle coming to ISS, but uh, this will be one of those historic uh, launches with the first uh, commercial vehicle coming to ISS to provide uh, supplies, uh, not only for this particular flight, which is a demonstration flight, but really for the long term. Uh, this is the beginning of a long term effort. Uh, to have the commercial vehicles supply the ISS, which is a critical need for the, for the program. As Bill said, uh, we had a successful uh, flight readiness review, and then uh, prior to that, the program has what we call a stage, op stage ops readiness review. And at that time, what we verify in this new world order is really safety of the vehicle uh, within a sphere around the uh, ISS. We call it the approach ellipsoid, and it's about two kilometers by four kilometers around the ISS. And the requirements we levy on the SpaceX uh, company and any of the vehicles that want to do a burn that enters them into or aims them to come into that uh, ellipsoid uh, requires that they meet our requirements. And, and all of those requir requirements are built around safety of the vehicles and safety of the crew uh, it's, uh, themselves. And so we have spent the last uh, couple of years, several months uh, with our SpaceX uh, uh, colleagues uh, working through the verifications, all of the requirements that had to be met, the testing that, uh, that, was, uh, that we dictated, but also the testing they did on their own to validate the performance of the vehicle. Um, and then uh, as this part of the process, as we get closer to launch, we're cleaning up our verifications where they complete testing, they send the reports to say this is what occurred during the test, we review the reports, we review the data, and confirm that the vehicle's ready to go. So at this stage of, of preparations, as we uh, get close to an, a potential April 30th uh, launch, 
we're in we're in good shape. We still have some what we refer to as non-standard open work, and and that just means there's uh, some of the verification closures need to be completed. Uh, they're related to uh, hardware in the loop type uh, testing. It's uh, it's where you get the hardware and the software together and make sure they they operate the way you expect. Uh, so we have the last little bit of that testing uh, to go, and then they'll uh, s our SpaceX colleagues will submit their reports to us. Uh, based on the plan we have, and uh, and we'll review those and assume everything's fine. We'll be ready uh, for the uh, for the launch. What is unique about this, however, is you notice I didn't say we had any requirements for mission success, and that's what our SpaceX co colleagues have been working on and Bill uh, uh, referred to. Since we're not responsible for the the ascent phase or even the the early on orbit phase. Um, this is the responsibility of our, our uh, SpaceX colleagues, and we've left it to them to define their requirements and then meet the requirements prior to launch. Uh, and it's been a learning experience, I think, for both uh, NASA and SpaceX. We've really grown together as, uh, as two organizations, and I would say not only is the logistics that this vehicle will bring, not only this flight, but in subsequent flights, important to this program, but I think the relationship between a, a company like uh, SpaceX and NASA in terms of our design engineers and even us program managers have learned a lot from one another, and so that's been a great benefit uh, for us uh, as a program. Uh, quickly, the uh, SpaceX will bring up this, this vehicle, even though it's a demo flight, will bring up 520 uh, one kilograms of cargo to the ISS, so we are going to utilize the the uh, flight uh, for real hardware that that is uh, uh, necessary for ISS. And in addition to that, and and um, and an important aspect, unique aspect of the SpaceX will be the return of cargo. And we have about 660 kilograms of cargo that will be returned. Uh, some of it we would like to uh, get back and and uh, refurbish for uh, for subsequent flights. And so. This is a very important flight, flight for us, and, and we're utilizing uh, it as such. Uh, however, each, each piece of hardware that's going up and each piece we've put on there to come home, we did do an assessment, since this is a demo flight, we did an assessment and said, if things didn't quite work out, uh, is that okay? And we, we didn't put anything on the vehicle that we didn't think that we could stand to, uh, to not get home. Um, but uh, it, it is always an advantage to us whenever we can try to get additional information, and that's what we focused on on, on this flight in the return manifest. Just real quickly, I want to talk about where we are in the uh, in space station on orbit relative to this flight and all the other work. The crew has been focusing on on research, as as we've talked about a lot over the last several uh, get-togethers, and, uh, and and as we approach this period that includes the SpaceX launch and berthing, we have a number of activities going on. Uh, we have the uh, 47P launch that's scheduled next on uh, April the 20th, and it, it will dock to the ISS on the 22nd. Uh, shortly after that, um, the, uh, the crew will uh, return home. Um, Dan and Anton and Anatoly will come home on the 27th of April. And then after that, we'll uh, prepare the, the uh, uh, Don and Andre uh, will prepare for the, uh, the berthing of, of uh, the SpaceX vehicle. And prior to that time, I think Holly might touch on a little bit, we've done the prep work. The crew actually is getting additional training on orbit. Uh, but not only do they need to do that training for what's going to happen on, on uh, the 3rd of May, but they also have to do all the work they need to do to get the, the uh, other crew ready to come home and also to have the uh, docking of, of this 47 progress. And then after the SpaceX gets there, we have the next Soyuz that's gonna come up and dock, and then after that, we'll have the release and return of the, of the uh, SpaceX uh, demo vehicle. So, so you can see that while we are gonna focus on getting this new vehicle there, it is, a, it is a workhorse for us. It is intended to be a logistics vehicle that gets to station, it delivers its cargo, and, and, and then it, it departs so the next vehicle can take its slot or so that the crew then can focus on research. And, and it will begin that way with the very first flight. We're not, we're not opening up a big hole and, and having this demo take effect. It's an integrated part of an overall plan, and we intend to treat it as such. And so uh, we're looking very forward to that flight. And with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Al Lindemore. Okay, thank you, Mike. Good afternoon, everybody. So when the decision was made to retire the shuttle and continue our exploration program, we very much would have liked to purchase commercial services to resupply the space station. But those capabilities just simply didn't exist in the U.S. markets. 
So we decided to think like, uh, think like an investor. We wanted to become a consumer of services rather than a customer of requirements. That would be our more traditional approach. Rider requirements, go hire a prime contractor, and uh, develop the capability. But we believed that these capabilities were within the grasp of U.S. commercial industry. So five years ago, we set these objectives for the program. You could pull those up if you would. We had to learn to think like an investor. We wanted to place strategic financial investments to help stimulate the commercial space industry. Then we put some structure around those investments where we developed the program to have the companies uh, demonstrate these capabilities with the goal of achieving safe, reliable, and cost-effective services. We were looking to help lower the cost of access to space. We believed that that would, of course, help us out and also be the key to opening up new markets in low Earth orbit. And the third thing we, we said is, if we're successful in placing these investments and have solid uh, commercial partners, well then it's important to be able to sustain that new capability, sustain the new market that's created, and NASA would become a customer for those services. And by reducing the cost, we hope that this will also be sustained by opening up new markets by this uh, lower cost access to space. Well, we came, we uh, uh, followed through on that promise in December of 2008. Uh, not only had we awarded the Space Act agreements for the development program for the new commercial services, but we also awarded the resupply contracts for the space station. So we certainly uh, followed through our promise to become a very uh, interested customer. Uh, next chart. So this is a summary of the new capabilities we're about to see demonstrated with SpaceX. Uh, we did uh, sign the agreement with SpaceX in August of 2006. We've monitored SpaceX's performance over the years through a series of pre-negotiated milestones. And this is also a difference that, uh, from our traditional approach of, of uh, regular contracting. In this case, we only made payments after the milestone was achieved. It was up to SpaceX to uh, provide the necessary funding and resources necessary to meet each one of these incremental milestones and then when they were successfully made we we made our incremental payments to date we have uh, paid 37 out of a total of 40 for 381 million dollars of investment out of a possible 396 million dollars total on the agreement all the milestones are completed except for the last three this upcoming uh, demonstration flight that this is the second demonstration under our space act agreement uh, the first demonstration fight was completed uh, for our program in December of 2010. A very successful first flight of the uh, Dragon spacecraft on the Falcon 9, uh, an orbital demonstration and return. Next chart, please. Uh, in addition, we also have a commercial partnership with Orbital Sciences. This is a very similar uh, Space Act agreement arrangement uh, with Orbital. They, they st uh, started a year and a half later than our agreement with, with uh, SpaceX, and they're also making very good progress. We'll see Orbital planning to fly later this year. They'll be starting with uh, a, a maiden flight of their new launch vehicle, the Antares launch vehicle. This will be launched out of the uh, brand new launch pad at Wallops Island, Virginia, off the eastern shore of Virginia. So we're looking for that later in the year. Uh, they have five milestones left, the completion of the uh, first stage assembly, the maiden test flight, um, then they will be complete the vehicle for the uh, demonstration to the International Space Station, and that agreement will uh, finish up with the flight to the station uh, uh, later in the year as well. Next chart. So this is a history of the performance of the milestones that we established in the agreement. Up top you'll see uh, SpaceX agreement starting in 06. Uh, it started with a series of design reviews, system requirements reviews, preliminary design reviews, moving into a critical design phase. 
Then SpaceX moved on to the test and production phase. We saw the maiden test flight in 2010. And then last year, we requested and received funding for additional funding for our program to help improve the chances of mission success for our program. So we worked together, SpaceX and I, and we came up with uh, a series of additional milestones to add additional testing to help improve the chance of mission success. This was primarily system level testing. Last year, SpaceX completed system level thermal vacuum tests, electromagnetic interference tests, acoustic testing, and uh, all that uh, was a, a, a very high importance to us. There was a lot of learning going on, and I think it is going to be very, very valuable uh, to us. So that was kind of completed last year. And now we're moving into the uh, finishing up our demonstration phase with the uh, d a demonstration to the station. So let's talk about the objectives of this flight. We, we call it C2, that stands for COTS2. It's the COTS Demonstration 2 flight. Uh, this flight originally was to be a flyby to the station. That is, it was to uh, do a rendezvous with the space station, and then it is to do a, uh, a flyby beneath the station, no closer than two and a half kilometers, or about a mile, a mile and a half. And during this period, it is going to execute prerequisite maneuvers that are required before we give the final approval for the final approach and berthing with the space station. These are the same type demonstration objectives that were accomplished with other visiting vehicles to the station, the ATV and the HTV, all demonstrated before the final approach that they had the ability to do GPS navigation relative navigation, absolute navigation, the ability to do abort maneuvers, the ability to uh, free drift and hold for a while. These, these are, are the requirements that must be achieved before uh, the go is given to do the final approach. Uh, that would be a very successful mission under the C2 program, and then it would re-enter uh, and be recovered. Uh, SpaceX approached us last year and said uh, they would like to attempt to also complete the berthing, the final approach and berthing to the demonstration on the upcoming flight. So after reviewing the proposal and doing the required safety analysis to be assured that the vehicle and the systems are ready to go, we agreed to give SpaceX that opportunity for uh, actual completing the berthing demonstration on this flight. That will also include demonstrating the LIDAR sensors. Those are the radars and the, and the rendezvous sensors that gives you the range and the range rate information as you approach the station. They'll be doing some close-in retreat demonstrations, hold demonstrations, and finally the vehicle will be captured by the robotic arm and then berthed to the earth-facing side of the forward node on the station. After about 18 days of uh, demonstrating the car uh, transfer of cargo to and from the station, we'll see the uh, Dragon unberth from the station and then, and then return, return home. Uh, we call this mission C2+. Plus. It's the C2 mission plus the additional objectives of completing this, the C3 objectives on this flight. So let's see, if you run the video now, I guess uh, we'll take a look at what we can expect to see. Targeting now for the end of the month, we'll see the Falcon 9 lift off from a beautiful day at the Cape. About three minutes later, we'll see the stage separation between the first and upper stages on the Falcon 9. Then about 10 minutes in the flight, it'll be in orbit. The Dragon and its trunk will separate from the upper stage. About a minute later, the solar arrays will be deployed. And then it'll begin its phasing maneuvers to the space station. It takes about a day to get to the proper phasing and rendezvous with the station. The second day will be used to complete the demonstration maneuvers I talked about. And if all goes well, SpaceX will re-rendezvous with the station. And on the third day, we'll see the uh, final approach. And the vehicle will be captured by the arm and berth. This operation takes about eight hours by the time you get in 
to the final approach to the actual uh, berthing with the station. After a few weeks on orbit, it'll be unberthed. And then it'll be preparing for uh, a deorbit burn and reentry about two to four orbits later. We'll see the Dragon reenter, parachute deploy, and splash down off the coast of California. That would be a very good day. <laughs> I wanted to thank everybody. We're certainly very excited to be here. This has been a great partnership between NASA and SpaceX. I want to thank my team. Uh, Mike Korkachuk, project executive, has been with us uh, since the beginning, and uh, his assistant, uh, Warren, who's helped make available the uh, uh, vast resources acknowledged at, at NASA to help SpaceX. So thank you. It's been a great partnership. We're really excited and looking forward to the launch. Elon? All right. All right, well, uh, I'd just like to start off by um, uh, saying thank you to, to NASA for giving us this opportunity. Um, as you may have heard me say before, SpaceX wouldn't have been able to get started without the amazing uh, work that NASA had done in the past, and we wouldn't have gotten this far without the help of NASA. So I'd like to be real clear in uh, expressing my appreciation for that. Um, and I'd also like to express a note of appreciation to, to the American public who are ultimately funding funding this and and just want people to know that uh, we, we've really done everything we can to, to make sure that this mission is going to go well. Um, it's been a huge amount of hard work by the SpaceX team um, in partnership with NASA. And um, I think we've got a pretty good shot, but uh, it, it is worth emphasizing that there's that is, there's a lot that can go uh, well, a lot that can go wrong in a mission like this because you've got to have the success of the rocket, and then you've got to have the success of the the spacecraft. Now we have we've launched the rocket twice before, and we've launched the spacecraft once, um, but they're still they're still relatively new. Um, and then uh, there's the the whole proximity operations uh, and berthing system, uh, which is going to be tested for the first time in space. And um, and so there's there's, um, there's and there's no there's no space station on the ground. So our work to date has been done with done by a simulation and by approximating uh, the circumstances that it would find in, in orbit and, and approaching the space station. So um, I, I think that's that's just important to appreciate that there's this is this is pretty tricky, um, and I think also for for for, for the public out there, they, they may not realize that the you know, space space station is zooming around the Earth. Uh, every 90 minutes, um, and it's it's going at sort of 17,000 miles an hour, and so you've got to launch up, then you've got to rendezvous and be tracking the space station to within inches, really, um, and this is a you know something that's going 12 times faster than a bullet from an assault rifle, so it's 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 hard, um, and uh, but but I, I think I think we've got a pretty good chance, but but there's like I said, I want I want to emphasize this. Um, that this is, as, as has been said um, by um, other people in the panel, that this is a, that this is a test flight. So um, uh, if, 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 if we don't succeed in berthing on this mission, um, then we've got a couple of more missions later this year that, uh, and I think we'll succeed on, on one of those. Um, and uh, yeah, so and I, th I think we've got some videos of the preparation that we can show. There we have the rocket uh, in the hangar at Cape Canaveral. The Dragon spacecraft. Now, one of the things that's worth noting about Dragon is that we try to design something that is um, very similar between cargo transport and um, and uh, astronaut transport. Um, so it's uh, we expect there to be relatively few differences between the two. And there's uh, Dragon um, mounted on. Falcon 9.
here we're doing a, a wet dress rehearsal, which means we load the uh, liquid oxygen and uh, kerosene, the fuel of the rocket, and, uh, and just make, make sure everything's okay. And coming up soon, we'll have um, the static fire, where we'll uh, light the engines um, and uh, shake things up a little, help, but keep the rocket held down, and uh, and then see if everything's okay before, and, and we'll spend several days analyzing that information, and if, that, if that's looking good, then we'll, uh, it'll be um, okay to, to launch the rocket in, in theory. So, um, do we have another video? Pardon me? Uh, oh, Cuts Milestone. So we've got one more video to show. They're just elements of the, the rocket and spacecraft being tested. And I think it's, it is worth uh, emphasizing that the, the, the Falcon 9 has flown twice before, and Dragon has flown once. Um, so I think a lot of people in the public may not be aware of that. Um, so the, the thing that's really being tested on this flight, um, hopefully, is, the, um, is the, the, the proximity operations and birthing system. So, and, and there are other things as well, like the solar panels and, and a few other things. But, but it's worth noting the rocket has flown twice, and the spacecraft has, has flown once. Um, all right, well, with that. All right. Well, good morning, actually, afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Holly Ridings, and I'm the lead NASA flight director uh, for the SpaceX uh, Dragon demo mission. Um, I'd like to tell you guys today that the operations teams have been working um, extremely hard for multiple years, uh, really preparing uh, uh, for the launch and, and leading up to uh, uh, this day so that we could come and explain to you um, exactly what we've, we've built uh, together. Uh, the first part, of course, is uh, when you incorporate a, a new team, a new partner, in this case uh, SpaceX, our first commercial partner, um, into the space station, there's a lot of technical things you do, uh, the nuts and bolts, make sure that we can um, talk back and forth between the two control teams, uh, the control team in Hawthorne in California at the SpaceX facility, and of course um, our team here in Houston. Uh, commanding back and forth uh, telemetry, back and forth, and uh, as well as information that can pass all the way from uh, their facility in, in Hawthorne up to the space station. Uh, so we put that infrastructure in place to incorporate them as a, a new partner. Uh, we move on from there really to build the, the framework of how we're going to fly. Uh, this takes multiple years really for uh, their team to learn about the space station, for us to learn about the Dragon. Uh, it's really a, a partnership. They are, are certainly the experts in the Dragon, we're the experts in the space station, and we treat it as one team. It's two dynamic vehicles uh, flying in space together, and it's extremely important that you communicate um, and understand each uh, team's roles and responsibilities. As was alluded to earlier, our role here in Houston is really the safety of uh, the crew on board the space station, the space station itself, and then the SpaceX Dragon team is responsible for the mission success. And we've built a, a framework working together where we should be able to get both of those items uh, successfully accomplished. Uh, we write uh, documentation, uh, procedures, flight rules, the things you're familiar with, uh, with the other vehicles that NASA has flown in space, and we make sure that uh, the teams are trained to use all of that information. Uh, so we practice uh, using our simulation capability, uh, learning how that process is going to work, uh, coming up with failure scenarios and talking through how we're going to react and, and recover uh, from those. And again, as, as was alluded to earlier, we've performed a series of those for all the different phases of the flight. Uh, the last simulation, just the final uh, clean run for the, the, the polish before we go and, and fly here shortly uh, will actually be next week. And so we're really looking forward uh, uh, to doing uh, this run one last time on, on the ground before, before we get on orbit. Uh, the other big piece of our operations team, of course, is our space station crew. Uh, since they will be performing uh, the, the grapple, 
of the Dragon vehicle, uh, the berthing to the space station. And so uh, that team, our, our crew team, uh, has been working hard to prepare uh, for this mission as well. Uh, the time frame that we're uh, discussing launching in uh, is one in which we've got uh, two crew members available uh, to perform the Dragon operations. And so we've spent a lot of time uh, communicating with uh, them, uh, Don Pedret and Andre Kuypers, uh, making sure that uh, they understand uh, exactly what will be expected of them. They, of course, were trained on the ground, uh, but they have been on orbit for a while while we've continued to work down here and learn new things. And so we spend a lot of time uh, communicating all of that information uh, to make sure really as the third piece of our operations team, they're ready to go for us. Uh, so now we're going to kind of walk through the, the mission uh, that we've put together. So if I could have the first still, please. You can see the different uh, phases of the, the flight. So we've got our launch um, followed by the, the phasing where the Dragon's still uh, far away from the space station. Um, as was mentioned earlier, we'll come up and do a, a, a fly under of the space station all the way around. We've got some demonstration maneuvers uh, followed by all of the new activities in, in the rendezvous and proximity operations. Uh, the berthing, finally the departure, re-entry, and recovery. And I've got some graphics in a minute, but before we leave this slide, in terms of roles and responsibilities, you know, really the launch and the, the phasing piece um, is, again, SpaceX uh, responsibility until they get close to the space station. Uh, that operations team is uh, taking care of, of the Dragon and, and designed all of that um, independently. Uh, we have understanding of exactly how that will go, uh, but certainly that's their responsibility. When we come up close to the space station, uh, then the interaction with the NASA team uh, begins, and uh, we've got some gates and some uh, process in place uh, where we make sure uh, that the safety of that space station, our space station, is protected. And again, uh, once the uh, Dragon has left after departure, the SpaceX team uh, takes over again and works uh, with uh, the FAA uh, colleagues and brings the Dragon home and, and performs the recovery. Uh, again, certainly that has NASA cargo, so we're interested in it, but from an operations sense, uh, the Dragon team performs that uh, function in terms of the, the departure and the recovery. If we go to the next slide, please. Uh, so one of the things that I mentioned uh, was the demonstration objectives. Uh, these were touched on a little bit earlier. Uh, we do have some demonstrations uh, to, to really talk about the abort capability. That's one of our primary um, sort of pieces of our safety infrastructures, the capability to always safely perform uh, an abort uh, where if there was an issue, the Dragon could fly away from the space station uh, to prevent uh, having any type of uh, collision. And so that's a very important aspect of our safety framework. Uh, different pieces of navigation. As you get closer to the space station, you have to be able to navigate more accurately. And so we make sure that all of those pieces work correctly. Um, communication, of course, to dynamic vehicles in space uh, need to be able to talk to each other. And then just the general controllability in terms of uh, the, the guidance and navigation, you know, how the engines work, those type of, of activities. This has all been tested extensively by the SpaceX team on the ground. Um, we've had NASA folks as well involved in the, in the verification. But these are really the very important uh, critical pieces that we want to validate on orbit, uh, look at that capability before we use it in a safety critical situation. So it's really a building block approach uh, where we execute a demonstration objective is what we call it. So a piece of functionality of the spacecraft, make sure it works, and then later in the mission we will need that capability. Let's see, next page. So here's our mission profile. Um, this is obviously a two-dimensional representation of, of two dynamic vehicles moving very quickly in space, as Elon alluded to. Uh, but if you look at the red arrow down in the bottom right-hand corner and, and think about uh, the, the dragon moving in that direction over time, uh, you can see down in the far right-hand corner, that's really the, the phasing um, uh, time frame, it's uh, not to scale, so that time frame could be, you know, a day or two or three, depending on exactly um, how long the Dragon's going to take to phase to the space station. Um, so that capability, uh, it, again, is the, the function of the, the Dragon control team. Uh, so the Dragon will, will come up, finish its phasing, and uh, where the, the red arrow is kind of pointing at the green line, 
Uh, that's about 10 kilometers underneath the space station, and it'll perform a, a, what we call a burn, so turn on its engines, maneuver the spacecraft, and head up that green line towards the space station, uh, ready to perform a, a fly under of the space station at two and a half kilometers. And so that fly under is very important to us because it's the first time the Dragon and the space station will communicate with each other, um, an absolute requirement for proximity operations. It's the first time that uh, the crew on board the ISS will send a command uh, to Dragon and get response. This is just a test command, uh, so it's a, a light on the Dragon, but it's leading towards uh, the crew potentially needing to see to send uh, more invasive commands uh, such as a hold or retreat or even an abort later and command the Dragon when it's at the capture point. Uh, we're also gathering navigation data. So uh, the way the two vehicles navigate together uh, is a relative where you get pieces of information from both vehicles and you um, do a calculation and then they know exactly where they are in space relative to each other. And so we're gathering information to make sure that navigation system works. Uh, so we're flying to the space station, gather all that information. The Dragon's going to head back down uh, to about 10 kilometers below and then uh, do a, a big lap around the space station called the, the fly around where it comes up the left hand side of that graphic. Uh, it's phased fairly far out in front of the space station by then, uh, greater than 200 kilometers. And so it'll perform, a, again, a burn, another turn on the engines and, and move the spacecraft. Um, headed up and over the space station, come across the, the top of the space station, and then down uh, the backside uh, relative to the graphic. Again, uh, fairly far out from the space station beyond 200 kilometers. Um, so that entire process uh, should take just about uh, a full day on the order of 22 to 24 hours to complete. Let's see, next slide please. Uh, so now we're kind of back where we started at our red arrow, um, uh, roughly again that day later, and we're headed again back up to uh, two and a half kilometers below the space station. Uh, remember that was the, the distance that we did the fly under the day before. Um, you can see the green dot, that's where we cross into what we call integrated operations. And so I mentioned earlier uh, sort of the responsibilities of the different team members. Our responsibility in Houston being the safety of uh, the space station and the crew on board the space station. And so when we're inside of integrated operations, uh, which is in close proximity to the space station, the team here in Houston um, has authority over the mission. Of course, again, we're working as a team and in partnership and communicating with the Dragon team. Uh, but we do have the final authority uh, so that we can keep that safety at the very top of the priority list. We've come up to uh, two and a half kilometers inside of the integrated operations and now we're going to head up uh, to 1.4 kilometer. The little dots, the little red dots, again, represent um, burns or, uh, again, a time where Dragon will fire its engines and, and adjust its height relative to the space station, so it's headed up closer to the space station. Uh, so now we're flying under at 1.4 kilometers. Um, again, uh, next red dot, this is our uh, approach initiation. So uh, this is the burn that will take uh, the Dragon um, on an intercept trajectory with uh, a position directly below the space station. We call it the R bar, so it's the radius of this between the space station and the Earth. If you drew a line from the center of the space station to the center of the Earth and uh, 350 meters below the space station, you put a little dragon, that's where it's headed. Um, so it's going to uh, end up on uh, in that position and uh, Eventually, we'll get to 350, uh, move another 100 meters, and actually pause automatically at the 250-meter hold point. Next page. So now we're up again on the R bar. Um, at 250 meters, the Dragon is holding, and we've got uh, some more of our demonstration objectives that we need to complete. Uh, these involve the crew uh, with some of the commanding. So you can see uh, the green uh, dragon represented on the slide uh, will approach from 250, so it starts moving towards the space station. The crew will then command a retreat, and so it will turn and head back towards that 250 meter hold point. Um, the graphic has all of the dragon uh, pictures uh, spread out on the left so you can see the up and back, but they actually all will happen um, on that R bar line just forwards and backwards. Uh, it's just hard to represent on the slide. Uh, so now we've uh, gone to the, uh, commanded the retreat. We're headed back to 250. 
then the Dragon team and Hawthorne will send the Dragon again towards the space station. The crew will tell the Dragon to hold. That'll be at about 220 meters. And so that will be the last of our go, no go uh, uh, objectives in terms of the demonstration objectives. Um, we do have go, no go criteria, and that's our, our uh, terminology that we use in our flight rules. We're here um, in Mission Control at Houston and uh, with Mission Control uh, in Hawthorne at, at SpaceX. We take a poll and make sure that uh, all of the systems on board the ISS, all the systems on board the Dragon, um, any type of uh, failure detection, you know, the robotic arm, the cameras, basically everything you need in order to do that next step of the mission is in the configuration you expected. And then after you've had that communication between between the two teams and everything is in the proper configuration, then the go is allowing the Dragon to proceed and continue with the next step of the mission. So when we use go, no go terminology, that's exactly what we're talking about. So at this point, we're 220 meters below the space station. Uh, we've completed all of our demonstrations. Uh, again, the uh, controllability, the navigation, the abort, um, we have taken the poll and made sure um, that uh, we've got all of the functionality we need and we're headed on up uh, towards uh, the space station again. We're going to cross um, into what's called the keep out sphere. So it's a, a 200 meter uh, circle around the, the space station, which we kind of use as a line of demarcation uh, for us to know that we need all of that functionality checked out uh, before we uh, head past that point. We're going to head all the way to 30 meters. Oops. If I could have this slide back, please, it might be easier. Thank you. So we're going to head all the way to 30 meters, and uh, the Dragon, again, will automatically stop at 30 meters. Uh, we're going to perform another one of those go, no goes, so a poll to make sure we have all the functionality. Um, at this point, uh, the crew is, is heavily involved with, with us. They've been uh, monitoring uh, the Dragon, certainly throughout those demonstration objectives where they were sending several commands, and also as uh, the Dragon headed towards the space station uh, with the capability, if necessary, uh, to go ahead and take action, although the Dragon vehicle itself is designed uh, by the SpaceX team to really be very automated and to take care of itself. The crew is really there kind of as a a safety net, um, certainly with the, the first flight of, of the demonstration uh, uh, capability. We, we really would like uh, to make sure we've got all of the crew involved as well as the vehicle itself. So we're at 30 meters. We've taken our pole. Uh, now we're going to head up to the 10 meter point. You may also hear this referred to as uh, the capture point. The Dragon will hold again automatically 10 meters from the space station. Um, another poll to make sure we've got all of the uh, technical capability required, and then we give a final go for capture. Uh, we tell the crew that uh, we are ready uh, for that capture, and then they really take over from that point. Uh, they have a command to inhibit uh, the thrusters on the space station, so those uh, will not fire. Uh, they'll take the Dragon uh, to what we call free drift, so again, where the thrusters do not fire, and then they will uh, drive the robotic arm, the SSRMS, um, out and capture the Dragon. Obviously, you don't want thrusters on either spacecraft uh, firing uh, when you've got your robotic arm uh, connecting the two until it's had an opportunity to, to rigidize. Otherwise, you might harm it. So um, that process uh, will be uh, taken care of by the crew. Now we've captured uh, the Dragon successfully. Uh, the next couple steps, um, we are, are headed towards doing a, a berthing uh, of the Dragon. Uh, we do some system configuration uh, to make sure it's ready to be berthed. Uh, we'll make sure that uh, the uh, common berthing mechanism, the passive side that's on the, the Dragon, uh, is, is clean of any type of debris. And then uh, we'll head on in uh, robotically with the crew uh, flying the robotic arm to berth the Dragon to uh, the node 2 nadir position, again, the Earth-facing uh, position. All of that activity. Uh, uh, from uh, coming up at the two and a half kilometers all the way up the R-bar takes place in one day. It's a fairly long day. It's about seven and a half hours uh, for that rendezvous and, and proximity operation. Um, the next morning, we'll get up and open the hatch for the first time and uh, perform the very first cargo transfer. Uh, we're going to perform roughly 25 hours of cargo transfer, uh, both unpacking and then packing the Dragon uh, while it is on orbit. And then several weeks later, uh, we'll get the Dragon uh, ready to come on home. If I could have the next slide. 
And so here's our reentry and recovery. Uh, in terms of space station operations, we take the robotic arm and uh, unberth the Dragon uh, from Node 2 Nader, unberth it from the CBM. Uh, we'll hold it out on the end of the robotic arm, make sure it's got all of its navigation capability up and running, and then we release uh, the Dragon. It performs a series of uh, burns, again, maneuvers. Uh, there are three of them. Uh, so one, uh, you can see uh, where the green dragon is, uh, a second one uh, at kind of the end of that half circle, and then a third one at the end of the second half circle. So a series of three, we call them departure burns, and then the dragon uh, will head away from the space station. We check that it is um, on a safe trajectory uh, away from the space station. And then as I mentioned earlier, uh, the operations team in Hawthorne uh, then uh, is in control again, of course, of the, the Dragon uh, in terms of outside of integrated operations. Uh, and so they will make sure that it's ready to uh, deorbit uh, and come on home, splash down in the Pacific, and then they've got their recovery operations uh, that they are going to uh, run out to bring the Dragon on in, uh, into Long Beach. Well, we're going to start with questions here in Houston, then we'll go down to the Kennedy Space Center. And then we'll go to the phone lines. We have quite a number of people, so we're asking that you stay with uh, one question, one follow-up, and we'll come back here and go back around one more time. We'll start off with Mark. Thanks, uh, Mark Caro for Aviation Week and Space Technology. And um, I wanted to go back to the uh, software uh, validation work. Could you elaborate some on that? And um, if I understood correctly, you'll have a follow-on to this FRR on about the 23rd. If you could sort of bridge what happens after that to the launch point. I can do a piece of it and then, then Mike and the others can also chime in. There's still some software work that's, that's going on. Uh, some activities are completing in Hawthorne where they're doing hardware in a loop testing uh, to make sure that the software works right with the hardware. Then when they complete those results, they provide test reports and test analysis of that activity back to the NASA team. Then the NASA team looks at that to make sure that it all fits and works the way it was supposed to go work. They'll also do some testing with the actual vehicle down in Florida. Well, they'll do the same kind of thing. Well, they actually run through the software with the flight vehicle. And again, those reports come back to the NASA team. We'll take a look at it. We will not do a formal review like we did today of that activity. What we'll do is we think that'll all be okay, but we'll get a report back from the individual teams, the safety folks, the software folks, et cetera. They'll tell us on the 23rd that everything went as planned. There were no surprises, nothing unique there. And then we'll just continue on then towards the launch. And, and some of the activities that occur towards the launches, there'll be a, a flight readiness firing of the engines. Uh, there'll be hydrazine loading in the Dragon capsule. A lot of activities occur in that, in kind of that final week. SpaceX also does their own internal flight readiness review, and they'll do that on Sunday, the 22nd, just in front of this review. So that'll be one chance for them to go through to make sure all their individual components and systems are ready to, to go forward. So I would say today we had enough assurance that everything is moving in the right direction. We're heading towards the 30th. We're not completely there. We want to go ahead and get these final checks from the SpaceX team. After those checks are complete and we understand where they all sit, then we'll, we'll say collectively this is the, the right thing to head forward. So we got enough assurance today that the 30th is the right day to head towards, but we still reserve the right to take a look at the data, to see what the software does, and see what the teams find as they go do a more in-depth review. Eric Berger with the Houston Chronicle. A quick question for Alan, then a follow-up for uh, Elon. First of all, Alan, is it accurate to say that NASA has invested $381 million so far in the commercial cargo capabilities for SpaceX? Yes, that is the total of the 37 milestone payments we've made to SpaceX to date. Okay. And then for Elon, you're in Texas today, and it's possible that Dragons could launch from Texas in the future. I'm curious what the state and maybe the federal congressional officials need to do to make this an attractive place for you to build a spaceport? Huh. Um, but I, I don't want us to get too, too off topic, because um, I mean, this is really about the upcoming mission to the space station. Um, but, but we are um, pretty interested in, in the possibility of, of, a, of a, launch, a Texas space launch site. Um, and uh, I, I think there's um, a, lot, a lot of good action being taken by the um, local authorities in the Brownsville area in particular. Um, n n not that much at the state level. We'd certainly appreciate more, more help at the state level. Um, and, uh, and then at the federal level, it's not really 
you know, I think the federal level is relatively different as to what, what state we, we launch from. Um, but we thought it was important to look at having a, a third launch site just to make sure in the future that uh, if we have um, a lot of missions taking place for you know, commercial satellite launches, uh, as well as launches to the space station for cargo and potentially crew, um, and, and then potentially de defense department missions, that, that we didn't encounter a, a, a launch site constraint. Uh, but I, I should point out also that, that we're also looking at um, potentially using one of the, the, the shuttle pads uh, at, at the Cape uh, for, for crewed flight. So um, we just want to make sure that, that, that we don't in the future encounter uh, launch site constraints. That's, that's really what we're after with, with that element. Hi, Kevin Quinn with KTRK ABC 13 here in Houston. Um, can, and maybe this is a question for, for Elon. I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe it's a NASA question. But can you describe, please, specifically weather restrictions that could affect launch and how those uh, would compare, say, to that which uh, was out there for the shuttle program? Are, there, are these tighter restrictions? Or are there lesser restrictions? Hmm. I think they're probably comparable. Um, we, are, we, are, we definitely want to err on the side of caution, particularly since the, these are initial flights. But I, I think they're probably comparable. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not entirely certain, but I think yeah, similar. And I think I would say they're, they're, they're pretty compatible. We've, you see it even in our expendable launch vehicles. We have a lot of triggered lightning rules. Those rules will be the same. We have basically the same visibility rules for the ground observers that are watching the rocket fly, those kind of things. So those are all pretty similar. The winds aloft might have been a little more restrictive for shuttle than, than they are for uh, the, the Falcon 9. But, but other than that, I think they're, they're pretty comparable overall. Thank you. Jeremy. Jeremy Diesel from KHOU. Um, question for Elon. If this is all successful, everything goes exactly as planned. <laughs> that would be awesome. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what becomes the next step, the next timeline, the possibility of seeing a crewed flight? Um, well, um, you know, the, assuming this is successful, then, then we look forward to a, st a steady stream of cargo flights to, to the space station um, uh, under our CRS contract. Um, that would be really super great. Um, and then, uh, you know, be because we've designed the spacecraft and rocket to be very similar between crew and cargo, you know, we're in the process, we'll be accumulating a lot of knowledge about how um, you know how potential crewed flight might work, and if, if there is an issue, I think there's you know a good chance we're uncovered on a, on, a, on a cargo flight rather than potentially put crew at risk, which is I think pretty helpful. Um, and and then we do have to have a separate contract with NASA for you know adding in the elements necessary for for crew transport, um, and then there's uh, uh, yeah, but there there are, there are a bunch of additional steps that have to take place there, um, but we're we're optimistic that that at some point Dragon will be carrying astronauts and that would be really great. Two years, three years, five years, <laughs> eight years? Uh, well, you know, there's a lot of variables between here and there. Um, perfect world. Oh, perfect world. Uh, well, it's probably like three years. Maybe a little less than three years. Yeah. Two and a half. David. David Hirsch, NHK from Mr. Safardini first. In the, given that the ISS is an international collaboration, I wonder if you could give us a sense of what the importance of the international partnership as, as far as this entire project and the role of international partners in the FOR today. Yeah, it's twofold. One is um, uh, the partnership, the entire partnership does benefit from these vehicles and, and uh, in fact all but our Russian colleagues rely on it. Uh, we utilize a, a suite of, of vehicles in the futures to, uh, to provide uh, up mass uh, to ISS and its progress, the, the JAXA HTV, the ESA ATV, and then the two commercial vehicles that we're talking about here today. And the lion's share of the up mass will be provided for the USOS segment, the lion's share of the up mass will be provided by these commercial vehicles. So it's very important to the, the partnership. Uh, this FR, just like every FR, has all the partner agencies are represented, and so it's important to them. Um, and they worry about not only the fact will it bring it up, but there are safety implications, there's plume impingement issues, there's uh, EMI, there's all sorts of things that we have to prove um, to the entire partnership that we meet those requirements. And all of our requirements are meant to protect us uh, from that. 
and our partners uh, per participate in the in the safety review boards and the and the analytical process of determining that we that we're not causing uh, uh, any harm to the rest of the spacecraft. And in fact, uh, the part of the responsibility of the U.S. is to sh ensure the integrated spacecraft is okay. But um, they would like to see the data, and so we provide the data that's necessary to make them feel comfortable that their element uh, is also safe from those aspects. Down here. No question? Okay, let's come over here. Hi, um, my name is Ken Skewabara from NHK. I hope I could make myself understandable in English, but I would like to ask a question to Mr. Kirsten Meyer and Mr. Musk. Um, everything pretty much seems familiar for a reporter reporting for HTV, and I would really like to ask, um, what is the connection between um, this new challenge of SpaceX with the Japanese HTV approach and rendezvous docking? In other words, was there any improvements or what kind of implications have you had added to this approach for SpaceX? And to Mr. Musk, is um, I think pro um, safety is the priority, but as a commercial company, what kind of aims have you tried to implicate into SpaceX's new launch vehicle? And um, how would this um, challenge, this new challenge, would, um, uh, in a sense, um, uh, add to your uh, overall, I would say, um, uh, pursuit for that aim, possibly? First of all, for your first question, I think we learned a lot from the uh, HTV activities. We did a very similar approach when HTV flew the first time. Um, it flew up and it did a series of gates, very similar to what Holly described in, in a lot of detail here earlier. So the same kind of approach where we verify a capability before we commit to using that capability, that was done with uh, the HTV. And it was a good chance to see how that process worked, how it worked as a team. Uh, I would say also Holly's team and the, the flight controllers, they got familiar with uh, getting that data from, a, from an international partner in the case of uh, JAXA. Uh, they took that information, they could then digest it, analyze it, compare it, and, and work with them. So I think working with the international partners gave us a lot of experience of working with a, a different community that we don't work with every day that allowed us to, to learn how to exchange data back and forth, how to communicate, and how to develop the basic procedure that allows us to, to learn incrementally, that allows us to get into the birthing box to be picked up with the, uh, with the SSRMS. And I think also that the birthing box concept and using the SSRMS to pick up uh, the dragon, that's very similar to what we did with HTV. And again, that HTV kind of paved the way of, of seeing how the crew would use the arm, the overlays they use, the camera ops they use. A lot of that was kind of proven the first time through with the HTV flights that are coming up. So we learned a lot from our international partners and we applied it to the commercial sector and to Dragon and it, and it made it a lot easier when we come into this flight. It wasn't uh, the first time around we've seen this stuff, we've seen the basic process and procedure, although the vehicle is, is very different than, than the Japanese uh, transfer vehicle. I think we're, we're um, great, grateful for the prior work of HTV as well, you know, because it, it made things easier for SpaceX to, you know, um, approach the space station because of some similarities in, in the way things are done. So that, that, was, very, that was quite helpful. The, the way in which Dragon is, is most significantly different is that it returns to Earth, um, it, well, rather intact. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's got a heat shield and everything, so you can return cargo to us. So that that's probably the biggest difference. Um, and uh, the the uh, I, I touched on this briefly earlier, but um, because of that, there's so many similarities between the cargo version of Dragon and the crew version of Dragon. We, we're learning a great deal about uh, crew transport when we do a cargo mission. Um, I mean, technically, if you've got a little oxygen bottle. Um, you could, and you stowed away on Dragon, uh, you, in theory, be okay. You could go to the space station if you're tucked away in there. Um, and uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's kind of neat in that respect. And, and come back, too. <laughs> um, so, um, and, and then, you know, there's, there's sort of a larger context of, of SpaceX where we want to keep, um, up, keep upgrading the technology um, and making improvements uh, so that uh, ultimately, um, that there can be journeys beyond the space station. It would, so that's, uh, that, 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 that's obviously a topic for another day, but I think there's a lot of 
excitement about that, and we're going to keep improving the, the Dragon technology. Um, so we have, we have an upgrade plan and everything. So. All right. Okay, I think that's it from here for now. Let's go down to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida and take questions from there. Uh, hello, this is Marcia Dunn of the Associated Press with a question for Mr. Musk. Um, there's still a fair number of people not totally on board with commercial, the commercial side, especially regarding crew transport. And I'm wondering if you, you feel a lot of pressure as you go into this last two weeks before launch to succeed, and how important is it in your mind to launch successfully into birth on this flight? Well, it, there's, there's no question that uh, there's, there's going to be um, some people who will put, I think, too much weight on this flight because it is explicitly a test flight. And um, it, indeed, it, 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 we may not succeed in getting all the way to the space station, as I um, articulated earlier. Um, but, but I think it would be a mistake to put too much weight on this flight because there are uh, hopefully going to be two more flights later this year to the space station, which will be um, almost identical configuration. So if this one um, doesn't succeed in getting to the space station, I'm, I'm confident that one of the other two will. And um, you know, we'll work with NASA to resolve any issues and, and, uh, uh, and, and then and, you know, figure those out and, and then get to, get to the space station. Uh, but there should be no doubt about, um, about our resolve that we will get to the space station, whether it's on this mission or on, or on a future one. Um, and, um, and, I, and I don't think that um, if, if this mission just does, doesn't get all the way there, that it should be taken as a verdict on uh, commercial crew transport. Um, I think that would, that would be, that would just wouldn't be right, um, although there will be some people who, who try to do that. Thank you. And, and if this does go well, what is your timeline for those next two flights? Uh, well, that's something we have to work with NASA on. But um, you know, I think it's there'll probably be um, one in the summer and one at the end of the year. But but that that time timing remains to be uh, worked out with NASA. This is Philip Sloss with NASASpaceflight.com. I believe this is uh, for Ms. Ridings. Um, can you talk about for an April 30th launch, um, the, when would the, that, that red arrow that you talked about on the slide for the, the racetrack that you're doing, about what time after liftoff, sort of mission off time, would that begin? Okay, so for an April 30th launch, uh, launch is 11.22 a.m. Uh, Central Daylight Time, and you get to the, right before the red arrow is on the order of 38, 39 hours. Uh, so if you were using uh, shuttle nomenclature, which the NASA folks uh, still do, it'd be a, a flight day three uh, fly under. Uh, so flight day one launch, flight day two is really, we call it far field phasing, uh, flight day three fly under, so 38, 39 hours. The fly under itself is on the order of uh, three or four hours where we're gathering that data. And then uh, if you remember kind of from the red arrow all the way around roughly 22 hours, um, and so you're, you're coming back uh, the next day really for a, a flight day four uh, berthing, uh, rendezvous and berthing. Um, so I'll go through it one more time slower. Flight day one launch, flight day two phasing, flight day three fly under, uh, which is May 2nd in our uh, scenario, and then uh, a flight day four uh, proximity operation rendezvous and berthing, so May 3rd. Uh, the capture itself, uh, kind of early morning, uh, Central Daylight Time, 7.30, uh, of course, crew day, that's kind of midday crew day. Uh, so uh, the activities will start uh, pretty early in the morning. Houston time and even earlier in the morning, uh, California time. Uh, but the capture would be uh, about 7.30 a.m. Uh, in the morning is, is what it would be planned for on that uh, May 3rd. Thanks. and. Uh I believe there, if I understand this correctly, there's a, the, the, the primary opportunities on April 30th, and then uh, there's a secondary opportunity on May 3rd. Um, can somebody explain why there are not, uh, there isn't a daily launch opportunity for this mission, and is this just a mission-specific thing? Thanks. Here, yeah. So. So I'll talk about it a, a little bit. So some of it is, is mission specific uh, because of the demonstration. You know, as, as Elon talked about, uh, this is the, definitely the demonstration, and so there's a lot more things on this flight uh, 
that uh, the fly under is one of them, uh, some of the objectives that we're performing, uh, the analysis that needs to be performed of the data that's gathered on orbit. Um, so the fly under is, is unique to this uh, demonstration uh, mission. And so uh, that uh, really kind of helps uh, figure out exactly what the launch dates are. Um, the SpaceX team's also um, reserving some, some margin um, that, that they can talk about, Elon can talk about a little bit, uh, just for contingencies. Again, it's a demonstration, and they want to make sure they've got enough margin uh, if, they, if they need it on orbit. Uh, we're also um, always working on uh, the ISS uh, trajectory. So we've got uh, Soyuz uh, flights uh, coming and going. We've got Progress flights coming and going. We've got ATV activities. Um, as was uh, articulated earlier. And so uh, the ISS trajectory is in flux as well. So when you add up all of those different components, uh, you end up with these uh, kind of uh, just smattering of launch dates in, in the early May time frame. Uh, after the demonstration is complete and we look at all the data, uh, potentially we'll be able to, to find uh, those back-to-back -back type things that you were used to with shuttle. Uh, but we've got to, to gather a bunch of data before we can get to the point where we understand that in detail. Yeah, I, I mean, I can say in future missions, there'll probably be more, more uh, you know, something closer to uh, daily opportunities. But for this mission, we, we, we want to have a really optimal um, launch. So we're minimizing the propellant usage getting to the space station. Um, and that's, that tends to occur roughly every three days. Um, so we just want to have as much propellant available in case something goes wrong and we need to uh, make, make adjustments um, to the mission. Um, yeah, so that's why the three days. Hi, it's James Dean from Florida today. And, and just following up on that topic, I wondered if uh, I, I understand, I guess, that you have April April 30 and <clears throat> May 3 as the uh, the first couple of opportunities. Just wondered if you could elaborate any further on um, if there, there are any scrubs or anything like that. Um, are there any blackouts due to the range or, or uh, the Soyuz launch or any other issues? And so, you know, when, when did the opportunities fit into the rest of that schedule? So I can go ahead, I can go ahead and take that one as, as well. Uh, so there's actually a little bit of all of those things. Um, there's certainly range conflicts. There are always range conflicts. Um, there are some beta cutouts uh, in terms of a space station. There are some ground rule and constraint type cutouts where we don't want uh, a Soyuz vehicle and the Dragon vehicle uh, exactly on top of each other. We've got to make sure we get uh, one activity completed before we start uh, the next one. Uh, the Dragon uh, has some constraints as well for their recovery, uh, where at least for this uh, demonstration, they'd like to, to land in daylight to help them out with the recovery operations. Uh, so there's multiple uh, constraints on the table uh, that we need to line up in order to find a, a, an optimized uh, launch window for this demonstration mission. So the answer to your question is kind of all of the above. OK, thanks. And then for, uh, for Elon, um, this, this flight, of course, uh, of course, it's not unusual for things to, to slip a little bit. But you were targeting November at one point and then February. And just wondering you know, what has uh, proven to be most difficult for you to get to the point where you're ready to go. Um, you know, if, if any aspect of this was a surprise to you at, at how hard it was. And um, just as a slightly unrelated question, I was wondering if there are any plans to recover the first stage. Oh, uh, sure. So. <clears throat> Well, I should point out that uh, the, the, the rocket is definitely not the constraint. I mean, um, we, we could have launched several uh, um, rockets, Falcon 9 rockets, last year if, 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 if it had just been the rocket. Um, and it, it obviously wasn't the elements of the Dragon that had been tested before, you know, the, the Draco thrusters or the heat shield or parachutes or anything like that. Um, the, 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 the tricky part was really um, related to the proximity operations and uh, berthing system. Um, so that there's um, the, the LIDARs, for example, um, which is kind of like laser radar, uh, thermal imagers, the, um, the communication system, making sure that we can communicate effectively with the space station, uh, with the ground, uh, and with NASA TEDRA system. Um, there were, uh, so there's, there's a lot of basically electronics, uh, new electronics on the spacecraft. And it's also the first time we're flying the, uh, the, the solar arrays uh, and the um, um, the radiator system. So, uh, it, so the, 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 those are new elements to, to the mix. But the, the thing that really 
I, drives the, the schedule is the, the, the software testing, um, uh, development and testing, um, and how, how that interacts with the hardware. That's where the phrase hardware in the loop testing, what that's what it refers to is uh, how, how, when, when um, if, does the software always do the right thing in, the right, in, in, in a particular circumstance? And when you've got 18 engines and you've got um, effectively sort of six flight computers and, um, and, and a whole bunch of other systems, just a, the, 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 the test matrix of that is enormous. Um, and, and a lot of people don't, don't realize that Dragon is autonomous. I mean, it's really, um, it's a robotic spaceship. Um, and it's going to go and do this complicated maneuver where, where it's going to both, both with the space station. Um, it's not as though there's somebody flying it with a joystick um, or, or that there's somebody on board that can make kind of real-time corrections. Uh, Dragon is kind of make, in, is making lots of decisions all the time to optimize the probability of success. So it's, there's quite a lot of, there's a lot of intelligence on board, on board the spacecraft. Uh, and, and all of that has to be tested thoroughly. And that's, that's the, the biggest driver of the timeline. Okay, I think that's it at the Kennedy Space Center. We're going to go to the phone lines now. Let's start off with the Washington Post and Ryan Vastag. Are you there? <laughs> All right. Let's try Wired Magazine with Jason uh, Parr. Yes, I don't know if this might be for Holly. Uh, early on, I was talking about some of the work that's being done or the training that was done for the crew on orbit. A lot of that took place on the ground. You said, I'm curious what sort of preparations are being done while in orbit? I mean, is there any way for them to practice any of the maneuvers? Uh, what type of, uh, I guess, what type of training is done while they're on orbit? Okay, so uh, the answer is uh, yes, there is the capability for them to practice on orbit. Uh, they practice uh, with the actual uh, robotic arm, so the SSRMS, uh, uh, they um, do some uh, grappling practice. Uh, again, sort of line up and pretend that the uh, dragon is there, and so they know exactly, uh, you know, looking out the window and looking there at their computer screens, uh, what the arm half of that equation is going to look like uh, when the dragon uh, arrives. Uh, they also have a, a simulator um, that they practice with uh, because certainly the the robotic arm is a, is a significant resource, and so uh, we do have a, a, an internal simulator that they can and practice uh, so they can do multiple runs, uh, some very complicated contingencies that we wouldn't want to um, put our uh, robotic arm in or that can't be done without the dragon actually there, uh, some abort type uh, scenarios. So again, they know exactly how uh, to react. So uh, those are their two primary methods of training. Uh, they also do uh, some scenarios where they set up all their computers and all their cameras, uh, more the familiarization uh, type training uh, to make sure they have quick reference marks. They can find all the data they need rapidly. Uh, and then they do some self-study as well. So uh, again, kind of that building block approach uh, to uh, hardware use uh, all the way to uh, the, the self-study with uh, the procedures and uh, talking to the folks on the on the ground. Well, up on the whole uh, the demonstration maneuvers and the graphic you showed with the, the Dragon going from 250 to 220 and then 230, 10 meters. If any of those particular rehearsal maneuvers don't go correct the first time, is there the ability to retry the demonstration or is it sort of a one-shot uh, attempt? <laughs> Uh, so the answer is a little, a little bit of both. Um, uh, the demonstration, some of them occur, you were talking about the ones on the R bar, some of them occur um, early in the mission, uh, shortly after Dragon gets on orbit. Uh, those activities uh, will take place. The data will be gathered. It will be uh, submitted uh, from the SpaceX team to the NASA team. Uh, certainly, if uh, we did not see uh, something uh, that everyone agreed to was acceptable, uh, the SpaceX team might have the capability to retry those as part of their phasing plan. That would be somewhat uh, dependent on uh, the margin they have before they get close to the space station. Um, if we uh, were flying under the space station and were unable to gather the data we needed, um, it could be done again, but it would require going all the way around and flying under again. Uh, but certainly uh, that would be an option if we had uh, enough propellants. Um, uh, to do that. And the ones on the R bar that you mentioned, um, uh, 
the, those, in order to go ahead and complete the birthing that day, need to go pretty quickly. Um, so if they, uh, mostly because uh, sitting again on the R bar is not a very good place to stay for a long time in terms of your propellant usage. You use a lot of propellant uh, sitting in that uh, area, holding your position underneath the space station at about 250. So if they didn't go well, um, it, it would not immediately mean the mission was over, but it would definitely mean you could not continue at that point in time. So it might be uh, that the Dragon uh, would uh, go off and potentially start another fly around, and we would talk about uh, maybe coming back and trying those demonstrations again uh, the next day. So it's absolutely a gate to come on in. Um, if it uh, did not uh, go well, we would look at the consumable resources and work with the Dragon team and uh, see if there was anything we could do to potentially uh, repeat or gather additional data uh, that might help us understand uh, the problem that we'd seen the first time. Okay, Scott uh, Powers with the Orlando Sentinel. Actually, I, uh, I think my question has been resolved, but thank you very much. Okay. I appreciate it. Uh, Mike Wall with Space.com. Oh, yeah, hi. Um, so, so, yeah, I was interested. Um, Elon talked a little bit about what some of the challenges were from the SpaceX side for, for this. I'm just curious, I mean, what have, what have some of the biggest challenges been for yeah, on the NASA side, since this is, is such a new mission for you guys and, and you're not responsible for the entire thing from start to finish? What what yeah, like what sort of difference has that made for you guys, and, and sort of what are some of the the, yeah, the biggest hurdles to have overcome with this one? Well, uh, I'll go ahead and answer that one. Um, to begin with, it's just getting used to the idea that we're not uh, worrying about the entire phase of the of the flight uh, is an adjustment to begin with. Um, probably the biggest difference once you once you settle on on that aspect of it, probably the biggest difference is we're verifying a system. Um, based on requirements we gave for performance, but in terms of developing the hardware, the design of the hardware, uh, how uh, individual boxes are laid out, um, the design concept, the components that were used, that's n not the kind of information we have uh, access to. Um, and so it's been kind of an adjustment for our engineers to create requirements and validation steps that give you confidence in the robust uh, nature of the design that's being flown. And so that was probably the biggest adjustment that we made. Um, it's been, a, as I mentioned earlier, it's been, it's been really kind of a, a fascinating um, process because you begin with this group of engineers that have been doing this business for many years um, who have gotten information passed on from from the engineers before them that have done this job a certain way with uh, a complete uh, push towards uh, safety and mission success because each flight was uh, so very expensive um, that while safety was critical, mission success, mission success was very important. And everything from the, from the procurement of, uh, of Tripoli parts uh, all, the way, all the way up to the integrated uh, performance testing of a, of a system and and uh, how you're going to put it together and how it's going to react to anomalies, all that was something that you've, uh, you've spent many, many years uh, in your mind perfecting. And then to go sit with another company and say, this is your requirement, uh, and then have that group of very, uh, very clever uh, engineers, many of whom maybe don't know that much about space, many of them who did, uh, but all, all of them very young, have them say, well, why? And, and instead of the NASA engineer being able to say, well, this is how we did it, the question was, why do you do it that way? And so when that exchange took, took place, it was a quite a enlightening experience for us both because once it was clear to the SpaceX engineer what it is that the NASA engineer was perfecting it, trying to protect against, then the light bulbs would come on and go, oh, okay, well, in order to solve that issue, this is how I'd do it with my design. And then the NASA guys would learn from that. And so th the biggest piece of it, I think, from my perspective, and it's, it's not a bad thing, it's just, a, it's just an adjustment, and I think actually it's been good for, for both sides, is that we've learned or we kind of had our eyes opened up to different ways of tackling uh, similar problems. And in, in that respect, it's been very beneficial. But I would tell you that, that it is an, it's an adjustment not to have the very detailed design uh, data that we're that uh, we're used to when you actually design the hardware, and we're more looking at it from a from a performance standpoint. 
And I would add one thing, too, a little bit, is that the space station team got to see a piece of this as we put modules on board space station. Again, the international partners built to a set of our requirements, but they accommodated those requirements in a potentially different way than we did. So in a non-maneuvering vehicle kind of standpoint, the station team got a chance to see how to work with a with a set of, uh, with a partner that essentially answers the how to our requirements. And, and Mike's discussion was very good about how both teams have really learned from each other. I get a chance to kind of sit back and watch both teams learn from each other. And it's been a tremendous learning experience for both of us. I think we've learned new things on the NASA side, some things we've always done a certain way. And then when we get asked now, why do you really do that requirement, it's really forced our folks to go think about it and, and we're starting to, to kind of internalize it. Hey, there may be another way of doing some things that are better. So we've definitely learned some things from SpaceX and, and hopefully I think they've learned some things from us as we go through. So as a good partnership, you'll learn from each other and you end up with a much better product coming out the other side. Okay, how about Michael with Popular Mechanics? Hi, I wonder if someone could break down more specifically what's cargo is going to be on the flight, what, what sorts of hardware, and also are there going to be any crew provisions on there too? Well, in fact, uh, primarily it is crew provisions. Uh, we're flying uh, quite a bit of food. Uh, crew provisions, some, uh, some replacement consumable type components. Um, we have one uh, Nanorex uh, payload uh, that's got some, uh, it has a number of student uh, experiments on it. Um, that's the that's a lion's share of it. A lot of it is food, uh, but the majority of it is actually food and uh, crew provisions. What are the, what's the total weight again going up and then coming down again? It's 521 kilograms of uh, cargo up and 660 kilograms down. And the down manifest is not completely finalized. One of the things uh, that happens once you get to orbit is you sort of agree on the mass down and, and the biggest uh, drivers of that mass, knowing that once you get there, you might change that a bit. Uh, but but uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do have some, uh, while we uh, kept away from putting one of a kind uh, uh, orbit replacement units or, or you know, major uh, uh, components uh, on the, the ascent side, we actually did put some uh, ORUs on the return side in hopes of getting them home so we could refurbish them. They're not required, uh, but uh, in a couple of cases, if we can get them home and refurbish them, it'll save us money because otherwise we would have had to pr procure that spare. Uh, that's certainly in our plan and our budget is to procure the spare, but but uh, this was a chance to try to get some home and save some money. So we actually do have some, some uh, ORUs uh, coming home on the down manifest. What are ORUs? Those are the replacement uh, spare components uh, to replace uh, components on board. We have a pump, a couple of multi-filtration beds uh, that were in the water processor, and our, uh, our JAXA colleagues have a, uh, a, a power supply box for, uh, for their communication system on orbit that's also coming home. Great. Thanks a lot. Okay. Lisa Grossman with New Scientist. Lisa? Okay, Jason Davis with Planetary Society. Hi guys, um, you had talked about some of the gates and specific checkpoints that the Dragon would be required to go through during each stage of the approach. And I just wanted to know who holds the final authority to make decisions during a contingency? Um, has that already been planned out in advance or are there situations where a single party, either NASA or SpaceX, would have to make a decision on how to proceed I'll take that one. Uh, so it certainly depends on where you are in the mission. If it's very early in the flight and the launch and that far field phasing uh, where uh, the Dragon is not near the space station, uh, then it's the responsibility of, of the, the Dragon team and, and SpaceX. Uh, but once uh, the Dragon arrives in, near the space station and, and near is kind of defined uh, by my, my graphic, it's coming up uh, about 10 kilometers below the space station. Uh, then uh, there are, um, and, and actually during the fly around, the, there are go, no go points. Again, I defined that earlier as a, we take a poll and make sure we've got all the capabilities. And all of those go, no go points, uh, the team here in Houston, uh, per our documentation, holds the final authority. 
Uh, there's also a couple other uh, cases. If we do have an abort, um, something that uh, is unexpected, uh, that the dragon needs to, to leave the proximity of the space station, and then uh, the dragon team can figure out that issue and, and, and put the dragon back on a trajectory uh, to potentially make another attempt. That process, um, Houston has authority over that process. And then if anything were to go uh, really unexpectedly wrong with the space station, even if the dragon is fairly far away from us, we would exert some uh, authority in the sense of telling them we're absolutely not going to be ready for you anytime soon. Uh, so we don't want you to come up too close to us. And so uh, there's kind of the very specific predefined uh, items. Again, those go-no-goes that are in our flight rule that are uh, those uh, height adjust, uh, again, the burns, the, the maneuvers the Dragon performs as it comes increasingly closer to the space station. There are those uh, points predefined as it flies around the space station and those uh, points predefined as it comes up to do the final uh, rendezvous and, and the berthing and the proximity operations. And then there's uh, those generic uh, catch-alls for uh, if something goes, goes unexpected. And all of that has uh, been discussed with the team uh, in Hawthorne and our team here in Houston and is all uh, written down in our, in our documentation that we fly with our flight rules. Okay. Uh, Jean-Louis Santini from Agence France. How about Kelly Sheraton? Okay. Eric with Nature Magazine. I'll keep going. Stephen Clark with Space Flight Now. Maybe they got tired of the music. Ann Walters with the German Press Agency. How about Irene Klotz? Thanks, Josh. I am here. Um, I have a couple questions for Elon. The first is, including that $381 million from NASA, how much more money has SpaceX spent to get to this point in the, um, in the development? And um, overall, what do you think the odds are that this mission will be completely successful in terms of docking at station and a, a successful retrieval um, after splashdown? Um, I don't have the exact number uh, that, that SpaceX has spent, um, but, but we, ha we have raised um, several hundred million dollars in um, venture capital, the initial part of which came from me. Um, and, uh, and then there's been ongoing uh, payments for, for other milestones that, that have been achieved for NASA and for other customers. I, I think the, probably the total amount spent cumulatively would be somewhere around a billion dollars. Um, so um, that's cumulative over the life of SpaceX. Um, and, uh, and in terms of the probability of success, uh, I have some hesitation about giving, giving an exact number since there's, they're, they're pretty big, um, there's a pretty big range, I think. But um, yeah, I, 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 I personally has, hesitate to give, an, to, to give an exact number. But I, I mean, I think that the likelihood of, that the rocket works is is pretty good since it's worked twice before. The likelihood of the spacecraft, the, the non-berthing, or portions of the spacecraft that have been flown before working is also quite good. Um, but then there's, there's much more of a question mark around the proximity operations and, and berthing system and the solar arrays, uh, which are being tested for the first time. Um, for uh, either Bill or um, Alan, um, could you just refresh my memory and um um, tell me what it would cost approximately based on, I think GAO did a report, if uh, NASA had developed a similar capability under a traditional cost plus award fee contract? Well, there were studies done that said uh, if you use our traditional modeling and our tr traditional approaches and assumptions, it could have been anywhere from four to ten times uh, higher under a traditional NASA development. Thanks very much. Good luck. Okay, thanks, Irene. Is there anybody else on the phone line that uh, did not get a chance yet or would like to ask a follow-up? Hey, Josh. Bill Harwood with CBS. Hey, Bill. Go ahead. Oh, thanks a lot. Uh, two quick ones for Holly. Um, if the Atlas stays on the range where it is and if Soyuz stays where it is, which they will, um, and if SpaceX doesn't get off in those first two attempts, what, how, when would this guy slip? Uh, how far would it slip, uh, I'm assuming, after Soyuz, and it wouldn't be a way to get it in between Atlas and Soyuz. Is that right? 
Yeah, so I, I mentioned earlier there's quite a few variables. Um, in general, yeah, there's a window kind of this late April, early May, which is the one we've been talking about with the 30th and the 3rd and, uh, you know, potentially some, some options. I know the Atlas is in there. Um, and then um, there's an after Soyuz window kind of in the, you know, mid to, to late May time frame. And, uh, you know, mentioned earlier a lot of the variables and all of those need to, to line up, but those are the two uh, windows that... Uh, are, are the high probability ones that, that we've been looking at uh, right now. All right, and one more quick one for you, and this will do it for me, Josh. Um, can you give us a little bit better sense of what sort of issues you guys have been working on the last couple of months with SpaceX? I mean, obviously they wanted to launch in February, and it, it slipped a bit, and I've never heard any good details about what sort of things everybody was trying to get resolved that took the extra time. Uh, if you could give me some sense of that, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, well, I can, uh, I can certainly tell you from an operational perspective, um, a lot of the capabilities that the, the SpaceX team wanted to, to work on uh, were their mission success capabilities, uh, things that, that Elon can probably tell you were very important to them. Um, so when they came uh, with those capabilities, that, that obviously requires a, a joint uh, sort of review and determination. Uh, one of the, the ones we talked a lot about was uh, recovering from uh, abort type scenarios. Um, those capabilities are, are complicated and difficult and um, we'd, we'd done some preliminary work but we really took this extra time uh, to make sure that we've got a real solid plan uh, so that uh, we've got a, a higher probability of, of being able to work together to accomplish uh, uh, their, their primary objective which of course is the success of the mission and so uh, we made our uh, teams here, the operations team as well as other teams uh, available to really talk through uh, some of those uh, items. Uh, that's my example, and, and I don't know, Elon, if you, if you have others. Uh, that's really the one we've, we've spent uh, probably the most time on in the, the operations world uh, talking about, because it's very important we want to be able to, uh, to, to do that as a team in the event that we need that capability. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's like, like I said earlier, um, you know, it's really just about uh, the hardware loop testing and, and validation of the software is, is that's that, that's the the, the the biggest driver. I mean, there were other things that were done in, in that time, but but just testing a vast amount of, of intelligence that that's occurring in the software um, and making sure, even in um, hi, highly unusual situations, that the mission um, is, is successful, um, at least in the in the simulation, that that's what's taken the most amount of time. Um, and it's uh, it's just it's just a very very complex system. Okay, thanks, Bill. Is there anybody else on the phone lines? All right, let's come back here to uh, Houston. Let's start back over here with Mark. Uh, thank you, Mark Caro, uh for Aviation Week. Um, I, I guess I'm I'm a little hazy on whether there's an MMT authority during the flight or if that is the space station IMMT that sort of is the big picture uh, it's, supervision. It's the space station IMMT. Thank you. Eric Berger again with the Chronicle. A quick question for, uh, for Bill and Mike. Could, could one of you address the feeling inside the, the space program with this launch coming up because this is an American company um, and obviously there's been a lot of heat on NASA the last couple of years relying on, the last year relying on Russian rockets for humans, and this is a potential way out of that. Um, so uh, is it something that, that, that a lot of people are looking forward to, uh, or how, how would you characterize the mood sort of leading up to the launch? You want to do mood, or do I do mood? You can, you can do mood. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, you know, uh, from our perspective, uh, what you're referring to is probably a combination of, of perceived emotions way back when, when we started down this road, because it had to do with, with getting out of the space shuttle business and getting into a commercial venture, and that probably played a little bit of the role of a misconception and, and perhaps not everybody uh, being completely behind this effort. Um, but I can tell you from a program perspective, and those are the people that I, I see and talk to every day, uh, we couldn't be more pleased with uh, what we're off to go do. And the reason is, A, it, it provides indigenous capability within the U.S. to supply the ISS, which we think is very important. It does have implications to, um, 
to human transport again to ISS. It's commercializing, if you will, helping commercialize a low Earth orbit, which we think is a very important uh, need uh, and something that, uh, that uh, NASA is responsible for. And, uh, and some of us, uh, and in particular myself, believe this is a very important step for us to take in order for us to do exploration in the future. Uh, NASA needs to develop and, and or encourage a capability and help the development of a capability of a commercial capability to uh, support low Earth orbit, uh, both in terms of cargo and humans and other capabilities, robotic servicing, things like that. Uh, and NASA needs to start focusing on, uh, on human exploration beyond uh, low Earth orbit. And so uh, those of us who are looking forward to, uh, to the next step for NASA uh, really are very excited about this next step uh, for, this, for the space station. And we believe this is, in order for space station to be successful, these systems have to be there for us. And, uh, and so uh, we, we uh, look on it very favorably and are very excited about this uh, pending launch. I think I'd add just a little bit, you know, this is absolutely critical to space station. Yeah. We really need this cargo capability to be able to get to station and the return capability that Dragon provides is, is truly unique of any one of the cargo providers, in, including the Russians and Soyuz. The amount of cargo we can get back with Dragon is just phenomenal from a return standpoint. So we, we absolutely need this capability for ISS and, and we're really rooting for the teams to come through. I think it's also been encouraging to see SpaceX um, to work hard issues. You know, they had some uh, EMI, electromagnetic interference issues that they worked and they spent some really good engineering time to resolve those issues and get them resolved. Um, they had some engine delamination concerns and again, they were very rigorous. They tested some things that maybe you didn't absolutely have to go test, but they wanted to go test them to make sure that they were right. That's really encouraging. So I can really, you know, get behind somebody that's doing that extra work to, to, to get ready to go fly. But as Elon said, this is really a tough flight. I mean, what, what we're asking them to go do on this demonstration flight is, is amazing. When you look at all those things that Holly talked about on her charts and the many hours that all this hardware has to work and, and all the software has to interact and the, the six computers and the, the 18 thrusters and all this has to work as a nice combined set to get into this precise box to be picked up by the SSRMS, that is no easy task. So this will be a very demanding mission and we need to look at it as a test flight. It's what it should be. We'll see how well that the test works out, but there was, they've really done a good job in getting ready for this test. So as a NASA team, we're, we're ready to watch, participate, and help, and we, we truly need this capability for ISS. David. Yeah. And, and just to get a, a more detailed sense of where we are technically today as of this meeting, the, the hardware in the loop issue that you were describing a little bit early, does that relate specifically to something on the timeline that Ms. Ridings was, was taking us through earlier, a specific element there, or is that, as you're saying, maybe something that's more generalized over, over the entire mission? Um, yeah, this, well, uh, so, so hardware in loop means, to give you a little more um, uh, color on that, it, it, essentially we, we have a, a complete replication of the, of the Dragon's avionics system on, on a bench, and, and then it, it, it flies a simulated mission, um, and it, it actually, it, it's like a, sort of like a, like a, Brain in a tub thing. It, it actually thinks it flew to the, to the space station, and it and it does. And, and we, we watch to see what it does. Does it do all the right things um, on, on the way to get there? Um, and if it doesn't, then then where did it go wrong? Um, and what happens if we unplug certain devices, essentially simulating failure at, at in you know at the worst possible moment? Does it does it does it then uh, take the proper steps? Um, and then what happens if you fail several simultaneous things? And what if you fail something and then and then restore it? Uh, there are many, uh, you know, it, the, the cross product of, of all those things is, is a huge number of, of tests. So there's there's just we're introducing failures. We introduce failures, yeah. Um, there's nothing along that timeline. Just to move it along, because I know it's getting late here. That in in Miss Riding's timeline, that you're specifically focused in as far as a mission element that 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 might be problematic. You you just need to introduce more failures and troubleshoot that and see how the system's going to react. Right. I, I, exactly. In fact, the the, the, the recent say in the last month, month or so the the, the the tougher things have been to deal with um, false aborts where, where it actually um, initiates a mission abort um, because uh, it was too sensitive to the parameters. So it, it, things were actually okay, but Dragon got too worried and and aborted the mission. <laughs> So, 
Um, from LA, so. You're right. It's so it's, you know, it's, you, you, you don't want to have, you, it needs to, it definitely needs to abort if something's wrong, but sometimes it may think something's wrong, but it's actually okay. Um, and, and there are all sorts of, and there are all different types of, of failure. Like, like I said, you can have something fail and, and stay off. You can have something fail erratically, where it, so it goes off and comes back um, and, and, and sort of oscillates. Um, you can have multiple things fail at the same time, and, and, and this, the system has to be able to deal with all of those contingencies. Okay, is that it here in Houston? Okay, before we finish up, we're going to take a look at our launch and mission coverage that we have upcoming here on NASA television. Uh, coming up at L-1, there will actually be a, a pre-flight, uh, pre-launch news conference from the Kennedy Space Center. And then on Monday, April 30th, at 10 a.m. Central Time, that is when our launch coverage will begin. And once again, launch uh, actually scheduled for 11.22 a.m. Uh, Central Time right now. And then at 1 p.m. Central Time, we'll have a post-launch news conference from KSC as well. On uh, flight day two, which right now should be Tuesday, May 1st, uh, we, will not, we will not have any live coverage here on NASA television, but we will have an update during our typical uh, daily ISS update show uh, here at JSC, which will air at 10 a.m. Central Time, 11 a.m. Eastern. And then on Wednesday, May 2nd, at 1.30 a.m. Central Time, very early in the morning, we'll have our fly under coverage from here at the Johnson Space Center uh, inside Mission Control Houston. And at 9 a.m. Central Time, we will have a mission status briefing here at JSC uh, as well. And then finally, Thursday, May 3rd, at 1 a.m. Central Time, that is when our rendezvous and berthing coverage will begin uh, here at the Johnson Space Center, once again from Mission Control Houston. And then at noon Central Time, we should have a mission status briefing again uh, here at JSC. Of course, all these times are subject to change. To see all of this and to also see uh, any of the slides that you saw today from our participants, just log on to www.nasa.gov slash SpaceX. All lowercase, it's important that you do that. Uh, if you look on the right-hand side of the page down at the bottom, there's a media resources section. You can find all these slides as well as the press kit once we get, uh, get it uh, finished up and posted there, as well as the uh, NASA TV schedule. So just log on to there to get uh, all of the latest. I want to thank all of our participants for uh, joining us today, and uh, we'll see you back here in a couple of weeks for the SpaceX mission. Thank you.